I met Dr. Kelly Starr at the first time in 2007 at a seminar. We ended up having dinner that night at Buca de Beppo where we shared pizza and pasta. Um, <laughs> the, the interesting thing here and, and, and why Kelly and I have been friends for so long and, and we've had our ups and downs too and things we've worked through which is why we're so close uh, to this day is we've worked through a lot of things and um, we've stayed close because of how we both look at human performance, how we look at the world. Um, and, and we share a lot of that information with each other and bounce it off of each other. Um, Kelly is first and foremost the, the person that comes to my mind about disruption because prior to him, I don't know anybody in sports medicine or physical therapy that actually was able to communicate with the world the way that he was doing that. Um, and, and there were a lot of people out there, but they just weren't doing it in the way that Kelly was. And, and that's what makes him really special is his ability to communicate, which is more or less why this episode is important. This is not about your shoulder pain or foot pain or knee pain. This is about what that pain means and what's going on in your life. And so I hope you guys enjoy this. And um, it's a pretty good conversation. When do you wake up and realize that things maybe don't fit right? When does that happen? Remember that age for you? Uh, yeah. That was pretty early, though. Like, I mean, really. I, I don't mean like you needed to destroy the system. No. no. And, get, and get a neck tattoo in the fifth grade. I, I, didn't get, I, I left my neck a lot. Are we rolling? <laughs> Good. <laughs> like, I never got the neck. And Aaron's like, you can't get your neck now. I'm like, don't. Are you tell me what to do? Oh, oh I'm, I'm getting a neck tattoo. <laughs> I fight all the time with Juliet. I'm like, just you and the girls' names and like, like genetic potential. Just like yes. the original, the best just t-shirt I ever had. Pain was is my your, companion. Dude, that was the greatest t-shirt ever. I don't know what it was about the fit of that I shirt. I stole that from a guy that I owned my first gym in, uh, Edward Gonzalez. And he, he let me, he was like, yeah, yeah, yeah go ahead. Pain is my companion. So it was on the wall up to his office at a spin gym that I rented out space and created my own gym. But that was the first gym. That was Genetic Potential, which then became CrossFit and Cool Beach, which then I got rid of and, you know, that story. But Best yeah. shirt I ever had. Best shirt I ever had. Yeah. I, was, I lament the loss of that shirt. Yeah, I, I mean, there's several event horizons, I guess, <laughs> where I, I mean, I think it was four entering swimming where I was like, yep, I need to be doing this. I, I need to do this. I want to do this. And I was stuck to that. Skateboarding was another. You think, do you think that it starts that early? Because what, for me, it's about a framework, mm -hmm. right? Of maybe trying to understand myself or trying to understand the world. And then you begin to, you know, apply this filter towards problem solving. And for me, physical problem solving was the same. So like I became my wake up call I was in the sixth grade, maybe going into seventh grade, and I went to the ski racing camp in Austria, mm -hmm. and uh, the Andre Arnold ski racing camp, and the, the World Cup champion was outlining the, the arc of a turn where the pressure was in the foot during the turn. And it was in German, and my German was pretty good, but I remember thinking, like, this is how I think. Like, he's speaking to me that I could take these complex feelings and actually give them words. That there was, mm. the way I was skiing as even a young kid yeah. could be described in technical language that reinforced what I should be feeling. And I remember thinking like, this is how I start to solve problems. This is, because it was such a connection for me. And I, I, that seminal moment. You were aware that, that this is how I'm gonna solve problems? Or well, I was, I, I was or, aware or, or, like or this is- there just this light bulb that yeah kind of i feel like I, okay this is how i think i like how he's talking about yeah this. yeah I, I okay so swimming and then it became skateboarding and bmx for me those became outlets and things i knew i had to do or i was going to be very destructive and even though but it was actually water polo when i think i was 12 or 11 maybe it was 10 right um where i finally found something because of the frustration I had in soccer and all these other sports that I didn't, I couldn't express myself in the uh, manner that I was, meaning I was very physical. 
and things would get a little out of control sometimes. So I would get frustrated and then I would take that out and that would become this thing. And water polo became that, oh, hey, what are you doing? Or hey, what's going on? Like down below, nobody saw what was going on. I'm like, oh, we can play this game. And so I started to play that game. And I think that was where I was like, oh, this makes sense now. Even though we're gonna be more physical, there's still some rules in the game, but I have an outlet or an understanding of that. And that process then manifested itself, I think, throughout my life, but to better understanding, you know, obviously, as I grew. Like, and that became anything. Like, I've been able to correlate that with anything where I get frustrated with things and I don't feel like I'm fitting in this mold or something. Like, oh, okay, here we go, light bulb moment. Now translate that, transmit that back to what I didn't understand about those other sports and maybe gave up on. You know, like I was bored with baseball. Soccer I was over with, you know, at the time. And water polo just became this thing where it was this combination. Nobody was doing it. Oh, nobody's doing it. Oh, there's that other thing, you know? Like I get to have fun with that. So much uh, what we're doing, I feel like, what I'm doing right now is trying to reconcile what we know works and the feelings of that with sort of this formality of training, mm -hmm. right? I came up in our, we, everyone did every sport where I grew up in Europe. Yep. And most of the sports we were engaged in were feeling sports, sliding, biking, mountain biking, and, um, and kayaking. And <clears throat> it, what, you know, I remember I was, I moved from Europe where I was just, we played and ran, and it was crazy, and you know, we would ride our bikes to Austria, ride down the river, you know, like we, we just, it was all about as much adventure as you could pack in, and, and being really self-reliant and solving, solving problems. Mm -hmm. And we, I don't know if I had a group of friends or how it worked, but someone would figure something out. The classic MO of early adventure sports and extreme sports, like someone would figure something out, and then we would all spend the next five hours trying to do it. Oh yeah. Right? Oh yeah. How, how'd you do that? Yeah. I remember coming back to the States when I was a freshman in high school. I went to Virginia, moved from Germany to D.C., which was a little bit of a shocker, you might imagine. It was, I got off the airplane, so I, mountains of Bavaria, and I got off the airplane in D.C. in August. Yep. And it was 100 degrees and 100% relative humidity, and I was like, I didn't know that places in the world could be like this. And then my mom signed me up for football, and I got there a little bit late, and I had to go do some testing for strength testing. And I was terrible. I had never benched before. I had never front squatted. This before. is when you were 170 pounds. <laughs> I was 170 pounds. <laughs> I'd never done any of this stuff. And uh, 179, thank you. Yeah, sorry. And um, I, remember, I remember thinking, this isn't correlating to my ability as an athlete. Because I had never played American football before, but I, in, in two weeks I was the captain of the team. Mm -hmm. And I Weird. got it. Weird. <laughs> and it was all about solving problems. So like defense, I didn't play defense, but I could see what was happening. I had this pattern recognition. And I remember being a, a little bit self-aware of this because I was such a disadvantage to everyone else. And I just didn't have this, any conceived notions of what was supposed to happen. I just was relying on these skills. And um, I remember even then being like, wow, I've never power cleaned or deadlifted or benched. How do I? But I'm still a pretty good athlete. Mm -hmm. So there had to be something in the environment that was, was into that. And that literally has been laid stone after stone to here. I feel like I can draw the straight line of how I've been solving physical problems and the things that I got interested in, being very afraid, putting, loving to be afraid, loving to put myself into situations where I had to trust that I would come up, you know? It's very E.O. Wilson of you. <laughs> <laughs> How do I drive consilience around, you know, I, but I, this is what I think we've both been able to experience, at least in our careers and, um, and even our friendship is an ability to now be able to connect it back all the way back. If you can't, if you can't connect it back, there's some gap in the model, right? If you, mm -hmm. And I, I think what's interesting right now is, um, you know, helping the world's greatest athletes become a little bit greater mm -hmm. and more resilient, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. But I've always had this firm belief that we should be taking what we're learning in 
sports and performance. I'm talking about Formula One, the greatest athletes on the planet, yeah. the greatest systems. If we can't pull out what our best practice is and actually apply them to the development of kids, yeah. the, the resilience and anti-fragility of yeah. adults going to be 100, yeah. we're all going to be 100, so yeah. what's this next 60 years look like? Then, then sport is just circus. And we should care about it because it's entertainment. Mm -hmm. But let's either, let's either all agree that playing professional sport, you're sacrificing your body, and you're just going to be crippled and disabled, and I hope it was worth it. Mm -hmm. Or, right, are you not entertained? Or, hey, these are things that really help us to be more integrative humans. And I think right now we're in this really interesting place where we're in this big environmental mismatch between, I think if I look at your development of well, the amount of surfing you did, the amount of play, and you had some real aerobic training early. You had some very formal things. Even if your coaches weren't sophisticated around water polo when you were 12, I guarantee you, you were getting the volume. Because oh. that was the model, oh. right? Just more volume. Yeah. You know, I remember in that ski camp, the, the fitnessing we did, we would ski in the morning, do another session, and then we'd go play indoor soccer or go for a long bike was, ride or test or I fitness, was, right? You know, swimming to baseball, to soccer, to like what? Yeah. Someone knew that fitness was a key, but maybe wasn't very sophisticated around developing that fitness. Yeah. And um, here we are now. I'm watching the world in general, just normal expressions of the system which people find themselves with the internet and driving and, mm -hmm. you know, the access to crappy food mm -hmm. and, you know, I mean, I think I ate, I certainly drank my share of full sugar soda as a kid yeah. and Doritos, yeah. but I also rode my bike a lot during the day and ran wild during the day. So there's a gigantic mismatch now. So now people, now we're saying, take this vitamin, do this treadmill. I mean, my favorite game right now is I try to, I look at fitness ads and they're like people running on a treadmill and a window, and outside is beautiful. <laughs> and that says it all to me, right? I mean, forget the Wally alliterations where we're, we're eating and we're not moving. You know, I, I think we've really lost the narrative fundamentally of um, what's the environment we're supposed to live, or, you know? And then, how, how do you create this, this human? What are the big blocks? And when you get down to it, what we're finding is these gigantic mismatches. And I, I don't wonder if the work that you're doing is it in is it largely implied by we're discovering fitness or is it coming because we're seeing so much dysfunction that we're becoming interested in, in the dysfunction right that you know what i mean is are we guided by dysfunction because all of a sudden i'm like hey what do you mean you can't squat down with your heels on the ground yeah am i guided by that or did i notice at the same time that when we were gave you back your native abilities and just reinforce those native abilities then, then it really came down to who was the best athlete, who had the best genetics. But now, there's a big mismatch with what's going on. And I think we're getting so many of the pieces wrong that if we can't go back and look at our movement traditions and look at our play traditions, because I think it's more sophisticated than I'm pining for the good old days when I would kick butt. You know? Or like when I was a kid, we walked school both ways. In the cold, well, it actually snowed back then. Mm -hmm. A, and B, you were cold. Yeah. Because you're never uncomfortable now. Well, yeah. I mean... And, and as we've gone on, more information we've gathered, so things have gotten more sophisticated, but we've continued to specialize this, oh, this thing. Sophistication. Like, so, yeah, so, so we've got Artifacts of scholarship is really what they are, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but now we've got this even more specialized person who is working inside of a system that is just another coupling effect waiting to happen. You told me um, we were doing the, um, this virtual bike race thing recently. <laughs> we were watching some footage, and uh, you said to me, you were like, I was like, wow, look at those humans. And you were like, they're so specialized, they can't even reproduce now. Yeah. Like that, that specialization, yeah. you're so dedicated to your sport that your bone density stops, your bone mass drops, your muscle mass drops, you can't reproduce, your you're like you can't, I mean, you can't, you're so weak up, upstairs that you can't do anything. Whoa, that's a heavy duty price, you know, yes. for specialization. 100%. And if you're not functioning how we're supposed to biologically, we know. Biologically, we function better this way. Yet we're shunting that for this progression of the specialization. It's just fragile 
That's just a glass box, I think. I, I mean, I, I'm not, didn't, like, I don't want to take away from the fact that I enjoy sport at the highest level because that is oh, why yeah. I do what I do. Like, I'm into it. I want I'm into to watch any it. sport. I don't watch sports. Yeah. I'm into every sport. But, myself included. And, um, you know, I mean, like watching Levi's documentary last night. It, it, it was. Hang on a second. We'll get the okay. light back on. <laughs> Boom. So, watching Levi's documentary, you see this guy. This is the story we just talked about us being kids. And, like, literally, he's skiing. <laughs> he's, he's an athlete. Oh, 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 he is for sure. And I, it became apparent because I was like, I wonder what his bone density is like. Because he was doing all this riding, and then all of a sudden, he's doing this downhill slalom and skiing. I'm like, oh, he's probably got pretty decent bone density. Like, he was doing all this skiing, but then he go and ride and then he like had all this other stuff his family was outdoors he lived in montana he was cat he was kind of an outcast whatever group yeah he became this weirdo athlete kid but he developed into this thing and always remained true not only to the diversity of his sport but from a psychological perspective you start to see something very very different and somebody who, yes, he loved winning and he was competitive, but was always willing to sacrifice himself for somebody else and put them up front. And that's something that we all love hearing and seeing, but this kind of leads me into the, the stuff that we talk about now. And although I don't know that we necessarily need to talk about the psychological side of stuff, although it's all connected, what we're seeing with movement and breathing and how it has a physiological side to it, I mean, how it has... Let me ask you this. I think we start with the assumption that sometimes that uh, we do sport because sport is good for us, right? Yeah. Makes us better humans. Yeah. I, I think a lot of people would hear that, yeah. right? And resonate with that. Is that a true statement now? Do you think... Do you think by de if you just do sport, you become a better person? Because I will mm -hmm. tell you that I no. feel like I, I, the elite athletes, some, <clears throat> some of the elite athletes I know are the most dysfunctional humans I've ever met. They, 100%. And it, you know, their psychoses, their psychology, their disordered eating, their, Look, like, it's we weird. We watched this thing called Losers on Netflix. It just came out. And um, one of the things was this boxer who ended up winning the title. He beat, he knocked uh, Tommy... Uh, I forget his last name, Tommy uh, Morrison, who, who was like the last great white uh, heavyweight boxer, right, of his time, and knocked him out, luckily, but he ended up, the next fight, getting knocked out, and it was just born, you know, it was like this loser, and he ended up talking, and he's like, he brought this whole point up, and he said, every, uh, every elite athlete, like, most of these athletes that are winners are actually losers, and the losers are actually the winners. You, you're forced to confront some tough realities. Bingo. And so you start to see that exactly what you're bringing up, except I think it's just like this whole power, money, popularity game. These are all byproducts of something that we are, we get good at. Like you got, like dude, you change sports medicine. You change the way we think about it. That is unequivocally without a doubt what you've done. I like to stretch. Little stretches. Little stretches. Little stretches. <laughs> that is, that, that's provided something that people don't, never really, th like, we're, we're just in this space now to where it, it all kind of is changing. Like, everything has changed. And we're, we've... We, we see the professionalization. It's almost the commoditization or the formalization of, uh, well, just since we're, since we're talking about sport right now. Yeah, yeah. You know, look at the impact that professional sports has, the way we fetishize it mm -hmm. and worship it. Yep. And its impact on college sports. Yeah, yeah. And then the college experience now, I mean, you have to really be, your kid, you need to be crystal clear and your kid needs to be crystal clear that if you're playing a collegiate sport, especially Division One. Your kid is a professional athlete and will have to have a full, another full-time job called school. There's two full-time jobs mm -hmm. without any of the benefits except for, I mean, getting a college education directly. 
look at the, the formalization, the fetishization of collegiate sports and its impact on high school sports. And look how that's trickled backwards. Do you think, to your point, do you think that, I mean, because I, I have these two daughters and I'm watching, they're, they're crazy ass parents of their fam the kids they are around and how they believe that their child is the next elite. Like we've just democratized and, and worshipped. And, and we have this egalitarian notion that, dude, if you have the right coach and the right money, you can be anything. Do you think that's exactly what you're kind of talking about in terms of sort of we think yeah. at the top mm -hmm. that money is going to make us happy, mm -hmm. that fame is going to make us yeah. happy, that elite yeah. sport will make us happy? Is that just another I, function of that? I, I, 100, that is exactly where I'm going with this. That is exactly what I feel, what I've experienced. I've been there. I've participated in all of it. I've stepped away from it. I've come down that mountain and worked back up that mountain to understand it. Um, I, I th it, this is my experience, but this is what I also see, not only it, being close to somebody like you and, and the people who are in my life, it's the same thing going on. People are think, think that this, that's going to solve the issue. And there's a reason why it's always brought up that the lottery winner is broke in five years or ten years. And unhappy. And, and unhappy. And you're, you're like, what, what is it you think? Like, we just, I just saw this. Uh, my brother sent me an article. <laughs> These kids in Newport Beach that went to high school and did swastika. They laid out sw a swastika beer, bong, uh, beer pong game and were doing these, you know, like goose stepping and all this stuff around. It's terrible. Like, that's terrible, right? And... They're calling for, yes. it, but they're calling for these kids to be expelled. And it's like, what do you think? Like, these kids are bored. Where'd they grow up? Oh, they're growing up in all this money, all this ease of, of, of life. And it's like, is it the ease of life? Or is it just the misunderstanding? Because I know plenty of kids who, I mean, I know a kid, lots of kids who grew up fairly wealthy who are ex incredible human beings incredible athletes. I know incredible athletes who are doing incredible things. So you take a Levi Leipheimer, right? Like, so you take a guy who had this moral compass or this thing and he made it, man. And then he stepped away. And instead of stepping away and doing like just, we, he gave back to a community and started a race. So how do you replicate that? Because I think what I heard under there is so much of what we're, we're trying to get people back to is how do you feel again? Right. Yeah. How how do you how do you what are the building blocks of awareness? How do you reproduce that awareness so that my kids don't end up like maniacs? You know, my mom. Look, I'm a single son of a single working mother. Mm -hmm. We were pretty broke. Mm -hmm. I remember. I mean, poor me. I never never missed a meal, obviously. <laughs> but uh, you know, there's a time where I remember it's Christmas. Mom's just trying to put herself through school. Uh, she's trying to get her PhD. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are so broke that we, we can't afford a Christmas tree. Mm -hmm. We go down and mom's got like, I got five bucks. The, the Boy Scouts give her a tree for five bucks. We don't have lights. So we make our own ornaments, right? Hidden from me. But I do remember feeling real stress around going to dinner sometimes and, and some of that stuff. And, and um, my point is that without the suffering, without hardship, how do we begin to feel? And I'm not saying I developed all the best defensive mechanisms around that, right? Like missing father, like there are a bunch of things that I've had to untangle as a human that I think I leveraged as a high level athlete on the national team, as, a, as being able to say, stand up in front of people and be like, I think we're wrong and let me show you what we're gonna do instead. I mean, mm -hmm. the huevos, right? And ego it takes to do that. But now I'm, I'm asking, how do I replicate those things without having to replicate poverty or adversity? And especially my kids, like I'm happily married to an amazing woman. Should I move out and just create some stress for my kids so they can make a pearl out of that dysfunction? Or am <laughs> and I... that's the thinking that's basically kind of going on, right? How do I, how, you know, or can we formalize, systematize discomfort and get to know ourselves. So my daughters are playing water polo, as yeah. you know, and there's not a bad girl on the team. And I mean by bad girl, all kids are intuitively good. 
They just have bad environments and weird parents and weird exposures, right? That sport is so difficult that there's a real difference between my girls in the easier sports, mm. and not that any sport is easy, but they're all not physically the same. Mm. The demanding of, this, this is of suffering mm. makes these kids egoless, generous, and there's a difference even in their parents, you know? And, and there's still, they're still the dad who want, is cheering for his kid and like, ah, you can't say why, you know? But there's something different about the girls here because you can't, the price of admission is real suffering. Georgia, my oldest, one of her friends who's a swimmer, came to just do a practice if she wanted to play, and it was so hard for her because the admission price isn't swimming pushing off the lap, right? The physiology, our friend has been able to, this girl who's a good swimmer, has been able to sort of nail the physiology, like little dose, push off the wall, catch your breath, like real manage suffering versus abject terror hey, I'm going to have you hold this weight and, and drown you right, and compete and change direction. And it wasn't for her. The discomfort was so uncomfortable, was so high that she wasn't into it. So where do we dose that out? You know, I was just yeah. at uh, how do we create environments that nurture the physicality of us, that break our egos in a way that make us feel generous and mm. responsible, that create community and tribe, What's that look like? Well, it looks, it smells like jujitsu to me. <laughs> you know what I mean? Really, like you want to, you want to solve the problem. My youngest daughter's doing jits. Yeah, it, right. she's trying to tap me out. How many, how many times, how many times a day you die in jujitsu? <laughs> every. You oh, die every single time. Every someone single, wins, someone loses every yeah. single time, right? Agreed upon. Agreed upon. Agreed upon. But to the place where you're like, well, I, I just died. Someone tapped out. You know. Yeah. So I, I think it's. Um, I feel like. Th so and we both read Norman Doidge's work. Um, but this, I, and you're talking about suffering, but I love or uncomfortableness. Uh, uh, regardless, I think it has to do with pain. And I think we are now in a world where we don't, we, we look at people in pain to some degree and it, it or our, even ourselves and we run from it. And, and look, I, I, I run from certain painful things that I've developed things around, right? But That seems very reasonable. Right? <laughs> very, very normal. Just to a degree. But the moment that I can confront that pain, I've just changed my relationship with it. And the science also says that. That if, I've, if I'm only dedicating 5% of an area to pain versus when I suffer with pain or I can't handle the pain, I'm dedicating 15 to 20 percent of the neurons to that area. So I'm literally taking on more of that when I go away from it. Therefore, in this paradox that I'm living in where your girls gutted out some painful stuff and that in turn gave them something that they didn't have before. Right, and, it, and it's an ongoing process. It, I think, 100, yeah. I think that's the piece. Where are the places where, you know, if I'm a runner and I just do my little tidy little runs and it's not the same thing. It's hmm. really finding out where I sucked, finding out the limits of my ability today in an ongoing lifelong, like we talk about I'm a physical therapists, there's like this dedication to lifelong learning. I'm like, that sounds great, <laughs> right? Are you willing to take that mantle on in the rest of your life and really face that awareness? What's your skin in the game? What's your consciousness around <laughs> yeah. this? Because that, that comes at a heavy price. What's, I mean, my favorite all-time book is Dune. No. Stick your hand in the box. <laughs> Our test is crisis and observation. He literally just sent that to me. <laughs> crisis again, again. <laughs> and observation, right? So, I mean, if that's, if that's the thing, you know, what's, what's interesting is the crisis can be scaled up or scaled down. You can't overhead squat. You, what do you mean you can't squat with your torso upright? That's what that means, right? That's yeah. The crisis is, can you keep your torso upright and squat down? No, you can't without compensating. So you use that as allegory for any aspect of your life. Yeah. The, I'm not willing to have a difficult conversation with a loved one. Mm. I'm not interested in saying to my kids, no, you can't eat goldfish and chicken nuggets and juice for dinner. That's not a thing, right? I'm going to 
how do what's the crisis in observation around you know what happens to my breathing when I get to end range position? What happens when I get so hot? Where, where's the psychology of this? And really, how do you set up a, t- a situation? So you, this breathing mm-hmm. thing, my breath coach, <laughs> this breathing thing, um, you got me into unequivocally, like maybe four years ago, three, three years ago now. Four. Four yeah. years ago. I die every time I do it. Every time. I'm obsessed with death around that. Like every time I go through a breath hold, I'm like, oh, this is me drowning, right? This is me, my heart stopping and watching myself. This is me being buried alive, smothered. We were reading. Um, this is what it's like in the jacuzzi. With <laughs> dude, dude, welcome to the. This is we're doing Restrepo, a salt bike in the sauna. But every single time I do a breath hold, I confront and fail. And so I, I'm in the habit of failure. I fail all the time, and not because I can't do one more rep. Like. I was like, well, that's, that's low failure, right? That's just not, that's not completing, but real abject failure by being let down by the limits of my psychology, the limits of my, you know, my, my physicality. You know, I wasn't able to manage the stress of my life and work, and my training sucks now. I mean, th- there's so much failure built in as a diagnostic tool, as a, as a regular feeling. So it's not... Pain is my companion. It's literally failure is my companion because mm. I try to set myself up with these things and because they inform me so much about the limits and the opportunities to have more meaningful relationships, to watch my reactions. And man, if that original hypothesis, sports are supposed to make us better, that's why we do them theoretically, they don't. They just create up a whole bunch of dysfunction. But in the sport, opportunity is a real chance for self um, you know, salvation. So you brought up jujitsu, and I think that's important because. Could you get that black eye? Yeah, I got I got a black eye from Kelly's youngest. She's ten. Who's trying to choke me out? <laughs> she couldn't, so she just hooked the she eye. Couldn't, she couldn't, so she, she hooked my orbital eye, eye hook. to move my neck <laughs> and slide it in. <laughs> At which point we both agreed that she won. <laughs> so I. Hey, can you take your thumb out of my can, eye? Thanks, no, Kate. she sunk the. She, she got me to move <laughs> and got the choke. Um, <laughs> the martial arts has played an integral role in history. It's arguably 5,000 years old to some degree, maybe older in some hist- historical context, but even to d- today, a lot of martial arts has lost its context. And you'll see that because there's a sport now that exists at a level to where it's really about winning everything, you know? And and there's nothing wrong with winning and there's nothing wrong with sport, I don't think. I think that there's this place for dysfunction like there is with getting a lot of money and winning the lottery. Um, And I, you know, um, but the basis of what it is we're talking about and what I think we've connected. And this is going after pain, going after trying to understand that pain, that turning into or that evolving into the failure game and understanding that at every turn, if I'm not learning from the failure, that I'm not progressing anywhere, that that goes not only into what it is I go into some gym and find out, oh, I can't overhead squat, so what do I get to learn about that versus forcing something to happen to not learn a damn thing and then wind up broken down the road. Well, I'm betting, well, I'm guaranteeing because of you know, 15 plus years of experience in this and watching more than 10,000 athletes in a period of time like we've been able to in a very unique way is that that is extrapolated through my life. That is nothing more than a mirror of what is going on in my daily life. And that if I'm my, the context of my relationship with what it is I'm doing in a, in a facility, in a gym, I'm on a, in some sport and competing, that if I'm not actually connecting that dot of deep practice and what it is a martial art was actually designed to do, is there's a reason why you get a white belt before you get a yellow belt or a blue belt in jiu-jitsu, right? And then it moves up. It's, it, it's why in most cases, it takes 10 years to get a black belt 
because you're not a fucking, you're, excuse me, you're not an expert. You are not an expert when you enter into that room and you're going to learn a lot of hard lessons and you're going to fail a lot and you're not going to win. You're going to learn what it's like to do that for about a year. Then you can learn a little bit on what it's like to win a little bit <laughs> and get good a little bit. So what's interesting is that that practice, yeah. that experience, the, you know, he, humans until, we'll just, let me summarize Yuval Harari. Okay. Until recently, we were all obsessed with not starving, mm -hmm. uh, not being wiped out by a plague, yep. and then not being killed by some attack. So there's some drive innate in us that reacts to this physical violence from other humans. And it's, it's difficult and costly, but someone coming in and taking your tribe, your, I, right, your yeah. stuff. So there, there's something Could only there. imagine. And like everything else, convoluted loss, people make money. There are very few places where I have been where there is very little. You can, there are changes, of course, everywhere. But if you go to a, if you walk into a studio where people are, you know, a, jo a dojo, a training center, you know, Ruka, train, Ruka HQ, mm -hmm. there is very little ego in there. The, you can't tell who's the coach necessarily. You can't tell. The, the, there's a formality around respect when we practice. Yes. Usually. Usually. We'll, we'll leave this, right? It's a saying. Yeah, 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 yeah. But the places where I get to spend, or, or the, the, you know, Forrest Griff or George St. Pierre, you know, like there's, yes. you can't believe that the physical manifestations of their practice doesn't match up with who they are as humans. It's that egolessness. That chance to reduce yourself. I mean, Carlos Castaneda in his last book yeah. is like, you should seek <laughs> out petty tyrants. Mm -hmm. People who just drive you crazy. And his notion was, that way you can destroy your sense of self-importance. And I, and I remember reading that and thinking to myself, isn't that what this is all about? Yeah. Sense of self-importance? <gasps> Ram Dass. Right. How, how do I, so how do I get back to this with my kids? Because... I think I have a job. When, we, when you went into high school, how many kids in your class tore their ACL? Remember any ACL tears? One. One. Football. Typically it's one, and it's a co bad contact injury. That was exactly Never a non-contact ACL injury. That didn't exist. The number of ACL injuries in kids, there is a, at UCSF locally here, there is a operating room that's open 24 hours a day just to do ACL on kids, teens. So what is it? What's going on underneath that, right? I have a job because people are saying, well, if I do this more, if I run more. How many kids have anxiety now? Oh. Do you think that's related? No, it's nothing, <laughs> no, nothing to do with the number of people in the United States on <laughs> anti-anxiety meds or, I think it's just that we're just un undiagnosed for all those years. Totally. That's right. <laughs> Add in suicide rates are through the roof right now, mm -hmm. up 50% in the last couple yeah. of years. Kids under 18, up 50%. So there's, there's some mismatch here. And yeah, I'm really good at getting your ankles working again. And I'm really good at saying, hey, when your knee hurts, I can come up with a mechanism for improving your movement and giving you strategies to improve the mechanics. But how did that happen in the first place? Because I think underneath this, and my wife would say, hey, check your mobility privilege, Starhead. But um, underneath this is, are humans durable or not? And I want to say, I believe, so maybe it's my Carl Rogers unconditional positive regard self, but I think... We call that the star out effect. <laughs> I think... Um, hang on one sec. This gets dark. Obviously dark. I think humans... Resting state of a human being is no pain. Like, that's where I think we're supposed to be. I think, I mean, bad things happen... But the amount of sort of physical dysfunction, I just saw that um, the billion dollar industry that it is, that is rehabilitation, like it's in the billions. And so what's going on? Are we really that fragile? Because I think if we take a, a pan back and look at this, what's happening with people's happiness and psychology and dysfunction, and are they happier? The answer is no. And, um, you know, are people healthier? Yes, we live longer. But is that, is that what we're, how we're defining health? And at some point, I feel like you and I are um, at the top of a ship. We're in the, the crow's nest. 
we're hanging out at the top, and we're like, rocks! <laughs> we're going towards the rocks! Like, does anyone see the rocks? And everyone's down there pulling on the sheets and steering and making, making paleo meals and, you know, and like optimizing this and taking this turmeric. And there's all these things, and we're like, rocks! And I think it's because we can see that so many of the ship, pieces of the ship that people can't see. We can see the direction, we see the currents. And I'm not saying I figured it out, but I'm saying I, can, I feel like I'm privy to a lot of data and it's not good. Mm. There's something going yeah. on. And the question is, where do we have this intervention where we get back to the fact that you're pretty durable, you're pretty anti-fragile. Your, design, your joints are designed to last 100 years, no problem. You're going to outweigh your gonads. You'll outlive your gonads. But we have things that fix that too. You know? So besides your gonads, your joints and spine are designed to easily be this long unless you, know, you fall off and break your neck. And something. We, even then, less than a year ago, you were paralyzed. And it's like seven months ago, and there's my daughter choking you out. You know? it's be, so we have incredible solutions, but something is strange about the human. And I, I, that's what this conversation is for yeah. me is why are you having neck pain and back pain? Why, why are these things unchecked? What's going on? And it, you know, if you ask my wife, who's the CEO, she'll be like, hey, you have to make it easier for people. You have to meet people down. And I always am like, no, 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 we need to talk up to people. People are smarter than we think. They're more resourceful than we think. They're just disempowered. And I think we're both right. I think we, we really do have to meet people where they've come from the experience. But the aspiration is, look, you can, take a, you can fix this. Yeah. Well, that, I think this is the importance of going back to where we're able to connect the story from our childhood or wherever we decided it began, right? That's taking yourself back down. The ability to see that way up is what allows us to come down to a level to be able to explain what, oh, hey, I'll meet you down here, but I'm going, I, I, I feel like we're, we're just bringing people back to like, or what we want to do. <laughs> And what we're trying to provide the world with is this area of fundamentals and principles that have gotten lost. And that is why we can look at a lion or an animal or an orca or you know, whatever in the you're wild. You're not talking about that drug lion being pet, right? No. By, in Thailand, not that, in a tiger, right? No. <laughs> not that. Because no. that's, no. that's allegory for who we are right now. No, ex that is exactly who, who a lot of us are. And so as we are on this, and, and Yuval talks about this in his books, and Sapiens and Homo Deus, as, as we transcend forward, and I'm currently reading another book on humanism and where we're headed, and you know, it's interesting because we've got a lot of people who are really, really intelligent, who are developing things and doing things, and I'm not saying they shouldn't, and shouldn't be helping us move along, but the fact that we're looking to a lot of these people who don't even understand biologically what we're capable of or have any skin in the game to understand that whatsoever, that we're going to skip some steps here. And I think it's largely a part of just this identity crisis where we're going around our biology. Like, oh, hey, I'm in pain. I'm just going to take this pill to get out of pain. Well, well hold on. Like... I'm not saying get rid of the pills. And if that's your inherited experience or someone so, said that. Yeah, I get it. Like, you I know, get it. Um, on the internet recently, uh, my, I don't post anything on the internet. I just don't. I always comment. I watch a little bit. Right? <laughs> and uh, It is uh, the toilet bowl. One of our friends, uh, the, a guy we know and respect, uh, commented on, hey, you know, you've got to take some personal responsibility for obesity. You know? Mm hmm and he, he kind of made this case that, um, you know, like, what's wrong with you? And Juliet was like, hey, you know, it's a little more complex and nuanced than that. You have to look at people's tradition, how they were taught, what experience they came. Are you a person of color? Are you exposed to racism and stress? I mean, like, you just can't say, oh, yeah. put the donut down. Yeah. Go, go to inner cities. And well, as she's it. learned, it's not, this is not a nutrition problem. That's right. This is not. It's a society problem. It's a society. You know, I want to believe if, I mean, Spanish flu wiped us out, wiped out what, just a ton of us, World War I, more, more people died of the flu than died of World War I. And that was only, what, 30 million people died in World War I? Just like an insane number of people. Yeah. So how many people died? I mean, there's a lot of people that died from Spanish flu. We just flu. watched that movie, too. Yeah. Yeah. So, 
what I think is interesting is, well, if we can get ahead of Spanish flu and, and these epidemics, pandemics, you know, we're going to have to reestablish relationships with tech and environment. Yeah. And we're going to have to eventually formalize things that we didn't have to care about anymore. So, you know, we have a nonprofit that you know about called Stand Up Kids, which is dedicated to getting kids out of sedentary sitting desks into more neutral, human-friendly environments, which is moving around a little bit more, right? Like a standing desk, sit on the floor, fidget, right? And people are like, standing is wrong. And I was like, is it? You know, what, what are humans supposed to do? Because what we're seeing is that this is going to have to become an issue of social justice. What we're seeing is when you and I went to high school, chances of you and I being a diabetic as an adult, one in 4,000. I'm just a physical therapist. I'm just talking about your knee pain here. But one in 4,000. And the reason I care about this is that if your tissues are crappy and you don't move, I'm, gonna, I'm always at loss. I can't always improve this. So I have to care about your nutrition. I have to care about your stress. I have to care about your sleep. Otherwise, your organism is sucky, right? So that's how I get interested in this. Ch when my kids come through high school, the chances of them being diabetic, I'm talking about my lily white, upper middle class kids at a public high school in Northern California, one in four. That's what the state is. Doesn't matter. Socioeconomic status aside, right? If you're a black woman, two out of three. If you're a Hispanic male, two out of three. So there is something. We can't even talk about the real problems because we're going to be bankrupt by people who are normal expressions of the system. It's not you know, nefarious. They're not, they're not malignant. They're not. These aren't bad people. These are people just saying, oh, this is what I was supposed to do. This is what was in my grocery store. This is how my mom ate. And fundamentally, I, I'm really deeply concerned, and this is going to be unpopular, that we're going to have to write off a generation of people because that's the correction it took before we started to get around this, yeah. right? Yeah. And that's literally, actually, what I'm concerned about is that you know, there's good data that says that when you're elderly, your lack of ankle range of motion correlates with your fall risk. And if you fall and break a joint, break a bone as an older person in your 60s, 70s, it's the number one cause of, of mortality because you break a hip, you become less active, you lose all your muscle mass, you become deconditioned, and then guess what happens? You get pneumonia, you stop moving more, you end up in a wheelchair, your, your life, your role in society. That seems like a really reasonable thing to fix if you walk around. What point are you not allowed to get up, not supposed to get up and down off the ground as a human being? That'd be never, right? Right. In cultures that toilet on the ground, sleep on the ground, fall risk drops to zero. They don't fall. Our elderly people in Japan who sleep on the ground don't fall. Why? Because they have to get up and down off the ground all the day. And you know what you need to get up and down off the ground? Things like hip range of motion, right? Back disease, hip disease, and cultures that toilet on the ground approaches zero. Because the society has cues around what you're supposed to do. And the cue is, oh, there's a toilet in the hole in the ground. Let me squat all the way down, mm -hmm. right, so that I can poop. So that makes me do all these things. And I think that's the model for what we're going to have to untangle this Gordian knot by constraining the environment. You want to solve childhood obesity? It's really simple. Juice boxes banned at school. No one is allowed to drive to school who lives within a mile of school. You literally, actually, physically have to put in constraints. You have to constrain the system in order to have better outcomes. That sport is not optional. You're going to get a ride home if your kids don't walk and get their 10,000 steps a day. So what are we doing? And what's really fun, of course, is that I can turn your dysfunction into a gigantic business. I love it. I'm here to talk about your shoulder pain. I love, you want to talk about your non-specific low back pain, which is not even a thing? What is that? Non-specific low back pain? What is that? That's, that's, that's a cop-out. That's not even a diagnosis. This means I don't know why I have back pain, but it's normal. Here's awesome. some drugs. Here's some stretches. You know, I, I really feel we've got a chance at fixing this. It's, we're at a place, my friends are so talented and so bright and so good at communicating and we have the internet <laughs> that we should be able to improve this and if we can't shame on us I mean that, I think that's where we are right now you know that that's the greatest frustration I have
and your ankles suck. Yeah. You're running like a duck. Why, why are you doing that? Yeah. No, no, you got you to have your feet turned out. I'm really, is that how you cycle? Is that how you run? You know? You're, you're a product of the environment. And here, I think, is the, the magic, is that this is not, there's no quick fix on this. No. You came in today, where was I working? On the floor. <laughs> because if I work on the floor, I have to sit in a bunch of weird end range positions. And guess what? I don't have to do something else. I just work on the floor, you know? Yeah. So how do, how do we think about that as an issue? And then what's interesting is that we can take our science and tape our, take the things that we care about, breathing volume, mechanical ventilation, the physiology, and we can, we can really tune this up. I, I feel like we're on the, the dawn of, of making supermen and superwomen. That's a yeah. fact. Totally. But we're becoming demi-humans in the process. Yeah. I, 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 just, I, I feel like this all connects back to this idea of kind of like deep practice and, and, and slash whether or not we're actually wanting to learn from this stuff. Yeah, it, like, how do you hey, even know? I've got shoulder pain. Like, how, how do we even get somebody to understand, well, <laughs> like... You don't use your shoulders. You, you don't actually use your shoulders, and, and here's why. And this correlates to everything you're doing throughout your life right now. Um, that's a huge leap, and this is where it's like, hey, you need to bring it down a little bit. You know, and it's like, you know, why talk, why the conversation needs to come back to basics, I think, and fundamentals. And I think that's exactly where and why I landed at things like pulmonary ventilation. And it was like, oh, I didn't go to yoga. Like, I was going to yoga because I thought I was getting more flexible when I was a triathlete. You know, and I was experimenting in the endurance world. And this is back when I was like, like, this story literally, and what a lot of people don't even realize is like, I was this long, slow distance athlete. Like, I actually really enjoyed getting on my bike and doing a century on like Saturday, or sometimes it was Sunday. And then I would run like 15 or 20 <laughs> the day after or the day before, right? And this would flip-flop itself, but I was just getting torn up. And I was like, ah, I guess I got to go to yoga. This is normal. I go to yoga. Right? I guess this is how I feel. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, this is how I feel. So I go to yoga, and then yoga ends up tearing my hips up because I'm like not paying attention to what the fundamental thing of yoga was, right? And it was like, hey. It's a breath practice in this. You should be breathing all the way in to get to this versus like, <laughs> got it. I got it. I, I can feel it. You know, I'm just getting there. And I wasn't able to connect that back then because I, had, I, I hadn't had the experiences I did and I wasn't right. wanting to learn, right? So go through this 10-year process of learning and all of a sudden, whammo, put on a device and boom, I changed my position in order to get something turned on. Right, and that something turned on is indicating that I'm ready to move. In, in there is this uh, really important kernel, central idea, is that my practice now, my work, is derived on do this, not do this because you may not get injured. Yeah. Right? The human being is such a complex system, a type one chaotic system, mm -hmm where the inputs and outputs are so tightly coupled that it's really difficult to see what the expressions of the system are unless we run this for 40 or 50, 60 years, right? You've got to come on, out unharmed at one rep or at a million reps because it may take a million reps in order for that system to express its dysfunction because you're so durable. You're so designed to... I mean, how many friends you know who are Olympic athletes who can have a cigarette and a little chocolate donut and still go kill you? All of them. Mm -hmm. They're amazing. Yeah. So the human is so... And, I, and as an aside, everyone thinks that they're special. They're not. No. Like when you... As an aside, everyone thinks they're special, but they're not. When you meet um, a unicorn mutant, it's mind-blowing, right? But coming back... I don't, I don't even remember where I'm going now. <laughs> so excited about all this. You know... What's that? Oh, yeah. I don't know. It, I watched the Yugoslavian men's water polo, national water polo team smoke cigarettes outside prior to playing the U.S. national team. And, and crush be, them. And beating them. And crush them. And beating them. 
where, where, is, uh, where is all this? How do we wrap our heads around, you know, this notion of what it means? What's, what are the bases of being human? Because I feel like once we can tune that up and tune it down, you know, we can solve a lot of misery and suffering. And, you know, if the vow of the Bodhisattva is to stay on human, stay on earth until all humans are, you know, w- willing to be saved, who could be saved, you know, should we save everyone? You have to be wanting to be saved. You have to want to feel better, yeah. right? And I feel like that's the, the, the mission underneath this is you can feel better. You have the right to feel better. It's not going to be given to you. I think one of the reasons we're going to have to care about this is it's going to cost us a lot to take care of our families, to take care of our loved ones who are in pain, who are in chronic pain, who are, who are struggling to self-medicate. You know, we had a, a woman who's in our neighborhood who's lovely, amazing. She's a little heavy. Um, she's a VP, super successful. We're talking about her sleep. She's like, hey, I don't, I don't think... Uh, I don't sleep right. I think it's related to my weight. You know, what do you think? We said, well, tell us about your process. You know, not like track this, do this. Like, what's, what's it look like? Tell me about it. She said, you know, well, I, you know, I'm pretty stressed when I get home, and it usually takes me a, a couple of bottles of wine to unwind. That's her Boom. self-medicating Outside to make her, to, right, to make herself feel better so she can go to sleep. Mm-hmm. Not seeing that that pretty much disrupts your sleep and you can't drink two gallons of juice a night. Like that's, that's, that's heavy duty. And there's no value there because this is a person who's been, she's been like, the system's like, here you go. Yeah. Work it out yourself. Yeah, and I, I mean, I don't mean to be laughing at her. Because, oh, you're not? But, but it, it, I'm laughing at the fact that I, I've been there. You know, I, like, I relate to it all. I understand it all. But I also understand that like, we're under this idea that there's something from the outside that's going to fix what's going on in. And that is not the case because we are just becoming terrible at this ability to transition. You know, I, I was just having a conversation with, with Rob, Rob Wilson on the way over here about this very thing. And it's like, look, if I'm standing on a corner out here at a light and all of a sudden I see some old lady who is crossing the street but doesn't see a car coming. I should be able to have the ability to instantly, completely go sympathetic and run out there, get her out <gasps> of the way, check and see if she's all right once I've cleared the situation, and then have the ability to go right back to, vroom, I'm cool, I'm chill. I just, I dealt with that. But that's not where we're Sorry, at. Sorry, your grandma is going to have to sacrifice herself many times in order for us to have that experience. Right. Or to any, practice any that. situation like whatever. It's similar to going on and then shutting off. I go to work. So bring it back to your, your neighbor. It's like she's on. I'm the VP. I'm doing my thing. I'm, I'm on. I, I killed come, myself to get here. I ki- yeah. Killed myself to get here. I and became so specialized, I'm no longer human. I'm no longer human. I'm now needing an outside in stimulus because I can't transition from this on to off. And I mean, that's been the basis of what I've been trying to understand for 20 years is like, how do I, this is where it's come. Like, oh, and how, how we're moving energy and what we're doing with energy and what, what are we using as an indicator for that? And why are we just listening to what's going on internally when it, Oh, you know what? Hey, I'm out at dinner and I'm, or I'm in a movie or I'm watching a movie and I'm falling asleep. Probably a good idea for me to go to sleep. <laughs> I'm just saying. And the, but I, I'm sure, I'm, 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 it's perfectly fine that if you're out to dinner and you're falling asleep, that you maybe stay engaged with the dinner. But hey, every night, if I've got to turn it on and go past that mechanism that's saying, hey, when that sun went down, that light that you were seeing, that's a trigger switch that says time to go to bed, time to wind down. That, so, you know, when it was not my dream to lecture adults about posture. Yeah. Right? And I remember what I was going to say, that we make decisions 
in our practice, my practice, about don't do this because you may not get injured. We don't speak to the negative. We make decisions about increasing capacity, right? You just made this really good point. I should be able to access my physiology to its fullest instantaneously. Mm -hmm. That's because we're great. Humans are just got to be able to go shift, shift. So apply that thinking all the way down. I should have to not activate my glutes or (laughs) warm up my tissues or, right? There's best practice. Hey, look, if you get warm, you know, we're going to be able to shift the blood out of your legs and without a huge cortisol dump and a huge, you know, epinephrine dump where you're not going to have to like turn the systems up to 11 in order to get this done. You should be able to have access to a lot of your physiology pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. If you have to swing your arms around a ton and do blood flow restriction and get hot and sweaty before you do a pull up, I'm thinking something's wrong, you know, and, and what we're seeing is this mismatch between what we should be able to do wholeheartedly all the time, then this native capacity and what we actually can do. And the decisions that we're making are choices that have better expressions to the physiology. Why do I care about sleep? Well, it turns out you have to care about sleep if you want to do these other things. Why do I care about your movement quality? Because the compensation from that, your workaround, your movement solution is finding, is falling asleep in the movie. That's a, that's a compensation to being chronically tired or overstressed, right? Your turned out foot is the same language, just expressed in a little bit different thing. So we're not really good at identifying movement compensation. Mm-hmm. What we've done is saying just move more of it, yeah. more, 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 keep going. right? And, and you, because you can buffer that, because you can fall asleep in the movie theater for a long time, you wonder why your hair falls out one day, or you wonder why you get a heart attack, or your blood starts to fall apart, or your hormonal profile shifts, or you start to put on weight, why you don't do well in your 5K or your match. And I think we're not seeing, for me, this notion of compensation is saying, what is the body supposed to do? It's a skill. But underneath that is a really clever software that allows me to continue on no matter what. And again, why do I make the decision I make? Because I'm trying to give you back your native capacity. So right now, physical therapists are saying, you know, we've gotten too formal around, you need to brace your spine, your neutral spine, and then hinge in these rigid positions. So they're like, it's causing people fear. And so they're like, round your back, do whatever you need. You know? And I see where they're coming from, because what, what they saw was an industry who suddenly formalized and codified and made rigid the extraordinaryness of the human being. Yeah. But why do we make, there are definitely definitive times. Dude, if you can't round your back, you're a liability. That's why if you go to a yoga class, you will round your back a hundred times in that yoga class because flexion of the spine is really important. Especially if you want to like pick things up off the ground or sit on the ground or, you know, like you need to have that language. But what we see is that people don't develop this capacity at all. Then they round at the wrong time and something bad happens. So we're like, ergo, rounding is bad. So let's never round. So people are literally afraid to ever round their spines instead of this choice of, hey, I'm super sleep deprived, but I'm going to have this glass of wine with my best friend, and then we're going to go ride for 20 miles tomorrow, and then I'll, make, I'll pay that debt. That's a conscious decision, right? I know that after I'm going to ride like crap, and I'm going to feel like crap after that ride, but dude, this is, I'm an adult, and this is a choice. What we've done is we've given ourselves no choices. This is the only position my hip goes, the only position my ankle goes, mm-hmm. and I'll, this is my only thing, I, this is my only play, so I'm gonna play it. I'm super sleep deprived and stressed and I have a huge mortgage, put my kids to school, and I'm gonna pay that bill. And I think what we need to do is get better at saying, helping people identify what those compensations are and not being enamored of the physiology because you are going to be a hundred years old. And if you're just, what do we call it? We call it a, what's the, the expression we came up with? Um, when you just, uh, train, 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 and then blame the training, right? Cause you got injured. Remember we, we had this, this notion of, uh, when people train and they're like, Oh, I got injured. It wasn't my fault. Or you fall apart at the day of the race cause you were so tired or you, you know, sort of, uh, th- this, um, it'll come to me, but yeah. this, this notion yeah, that yeah. Um, if you just work really hard, it should take out, right? Yeah. It should take care of everything. Yeah. 
you know, if you just, if you just ignore your family and your personal life, work really hard in business, you're going to be happy. Yeah. You know, it's sort of a, that I think we could apply backwards towards any aspect of your life. And again, come back into what's the point? The point is, are you pain free? Do you have access to your physiology? Are you flexible? Can you go up and down? I'm not talking about flexible like can you touch your toes. I'm talking about are you flexible enough to go for a run or pick this thing up and help me move or dart out and access this person? You know, the number of people who've stepped off a curb and injured themselves, I'm like, what is wrong with you? How fragile are you? You know, are you making a conscious decision to be an elite cyclist and set yourself up for like you have to, you know, be carried so down the stairs and touch el touch the, you know, you're so mm -hmm. immune compromised? Fine. So I feel like what we're doing is we're providing a plethora of tools for people to use to actually be more aware of this. It's too, it's too late. You need to start with your kids. I'm going to have a talk with your kids first. Totally. <laughs> so whether I'm talking about mobility, whether I'm talking about going for a bike ride, or whether I'm talking about using your breathing, these are all tools that are in the shed to kind of bring you back to what, what are we doing? What are you doing? How are we connecting this? How, what is the practice around this? And why are we in the dysfunction that we are? Obviously, you're not going to get a kid to buy into the deeper level of a lot of this stuff. You don't have to. You just have yeah, to say, no, totally. you can't have your phone in your bedroom tonight. Yeah, right? That's what you do. That, yeah. I'm the adult. There's no yeah. phones in the bedroom. Yeah, it's, it's where it starts, right? And where does that end up? And where does you know, this all change? And how do we you know, continue that evolution when, hey, the push is... No, I, I'm, I'm, I've, I've created a multi-billion dollar platform that, you know, can get learning into your hands and, the, you know, and this is where we're headed because, you know, and it's like, well, how do we convince ourselves that, look, we're not, <laughs> although you think you're learning things, you're also doing things that are actually reversing the ability to actually pay attention more and, and, and evolve the brain the way that the brain was, was evolving. Yeah. The phrase I was looking for is plausible deniability, right? Ah. That, plausible. And I think that gives you, yeah. we, we have said, if you're super successful in business, then you can, you can look back at the wreckage that is your life and your non-close friends and your terrible sleep, and then you can solve those problems. You know, I feel like there's a lot of people selling, you know, getaway, makeover, you know, fantasies. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean like an experience. I mean like here's this app that will change your life. Mm -hmm. Here's a mobility, right? And we're not doing a good job of saying here's how this integrates and it's got to change how you see all of these things. And it's a filter that you lay over to your life. And it's not that you're pining for some, pat, you know, paleolithic era where you're having hornet's nest soup with your kids and you don't have couches. That's not what we're talking about, right? No. But, you know, the internet has confused us as much as it's helped us. We have connected in real ways and seen more data and more skill sets and drawn more induction, inductive consilience, where we see a lot of data patterns. We're trying to reconcile what it is to be a human being. Mm -hmm. If we don't improve how we're relating to people in their lives and making it easier in little steps, I mean, the research around adherence and changing behaviors is this whole thing. This is it. You're hardwired for this stuff. And it's not an accident that porn and sugar and alcohol and TV are addictive. Serotonin hits. Your Instagram likes, that is crack. Your crack is crack. Sugar is crack. And what I think, I think what we're going to have to do is, you know, have to agree on some place it's got to start. 80% of us are not deployable for war, right? We're, we couldn't meet the standards to join the army. Mm -hmm. What did the President of the United States, J.F. Kennedy, do? He started the Presidential Physical Fitness Test. That was because he recognized that people weren't prepared to go to war. We better start earlier. And I think that's, that's it. If we, we've got this technology now, if my daughter has a phone, we fight and struggle all the time. And I, I think 
that's really the allegory for how we start this conversation is that you're never going to arrive. You have to practice. It's going to be an ongoing discussion with you personally about your stress and about how well you breathe and how you move and how do you eat and how do you manage your stress. And it's going to be like this. Sometimes you're going to be like, nailed it. Oh my gosh, something bad happened. I'm never going to not have the conversation with my kid around her phone. Never. Mm. Until she's out of the house. Why? Because it'll be a nonstop battle the same way it's a nonstop battle for me to eat enough vegetables every day. <laughs> right? It's an infinite game. And really, I think when we switch from just this... Just liver, bro. <laughs> just more liver. <laughs> hey, Georgia, you're dead buffaloes out there. <laughs> Rip me off a piece, would you? When we begin to start to think about these things as never arriving, as practice, as a game... The only way you can play a game is at the end of your life, you're like, wow, you know, I had less dysfunction. You know, my back didn't, didn't, didn't get me addicted to codeine. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, we are not doing a good job. Recently, someone asked me, like, how are we doing? Give us a grade. And I was like, D. Get a D because you signed your name. Like, you're trying to improve it. We still get a D. Mm -hmm. Your name is on the paper, so you got 10 points at least. Mm -hmm. That's where we are. Yeah. You know, so if you and I are competing... For the same slice of the pie, what are we doing? Comparative narrative, man. You go over here, I'll be over here, I'll meet you in the middle. By the way, we'll never get through the middle. We'll never get there. Mm -hmm. You know, man, I, this is not doom and gloom. I think we can fix it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And the body is simultaneously so sensitive. You know, when, when, you, <sighs> when you start to show what's possible for me, like it unlocks physiology, click, it unlocks. The body is so trained and reinforced into these ha habits that it's shocking that it's still so sensitive. But it's, it's like we can get down these holes. Learning to use your oxygen more? Well, I'll stop it. You know, that, what was that, uh, that great documentary called The Magic Pill? Yeah. About taking people in disease states and having them strip out the carbohydrate, getting them to normalize their blood sugars again by what, becoming a little more keto? Using that diet prescription as a tool for disease states, right? The same way that we're like, oh, everyone's keto now. And well, we're like, oh, is that? This go so that's this it. is kind of where I was going with the tool thing. It's like, okay, so you've got this tool. Now I go, whoop, and then this is like, you know, this is a lot like. It's, not the tool, it's my identity, bro. Yeah, exactly. But this is where the chronic pain. I'm a stretch coach. I cannot have a relationship with pain. I'm going to get away from it. So therefore, I'm going to, I'm going to be more sensitized to it. And it's, yeah. the tool becomes the answer. So I need to be keto all day long, all year long. Like, I'm not saying what, whatever you want to do. Like, go, you got to go, you got to go on your ride, but I hope you're learning from it. I hope you're learning a lot because, you know, failure is real and it happens every day. And when the tool becomes the answer, you, we just miss the point. And it's like the tool's only there to get us to feel what's going on in the system, you know, and understand what the system. What do I do about my identity and lack thereof? What's the problem with being, just being, what's the problem? I'm, just, ke I'm a keto CrossFitter. Yeah. Well, I mean, I does. was an endurance athlete. I was the running coach. I was the endurance guy, whatever. Like, you know, all of these things. I think, like, I've gravitated towards those things. I've been those things, I, you know? And it's like, every time I would hear it, every time I hear it, I'm like, fuck, like, God. My, I'm my, like, my I oldest just... daughter, you know, I'm like, Georgia, you, can, you can't eat crap all day long. You can't. In our house, we don't have a lot of crap. No, but she you can don't. Get it anywhere else. I eat out of your house <laughs> weekly. <laughs> I'm also like, Georgia, you gotta, you gotta move your body today. And she's like, oh, gee, my daughter we're going to do stuff fast. Low today. genetic drive to train. Like, <laughs> no, you have to prod I literally my kid. watched her with Juliet two days ago. And it was like the most emo, emo response to 13. working out I've ever seen. She's just on the bike. Not like, optional. Yeah. If you gee, want, how you, you doing? If you want, if you want your phone, <laughs> gee, what's come, up? If you want, if like, you want your phone, come with I me. I must have jumped in that garage five times before I left. Gee, what's up? <laughs> like, she's such a good kid, and right? so and she's such a good such athlete. A great kid. But low genetic drive to move. Yeah. Having to, you know, having to jolt, jolt her to get her to do these things. Keeping, you know, it's going to be constant narrative until she cared about it. 
all of a sudden she's 13, realizing you can't eat like a jerk. Yeah. You have to move your body, and let, you're gonna, otherwise you're going to look a certain way and have a certain experience. So use that as not, hey, I'm a 13 year old become body conscious, but what's important to you? I think when, once it's important to you, you'll care about it. See, this is interesting in the fact of how you're raising your kids. So I'm gonna ask you a question and this may feel like it's left field. Ugh. But I'm gonna correlate this back to a conversation I, I had with my sister who has four kids, right? And she homeschools them. Do you ever think about the fact that your kids love you? Or you're concerned about their love for you? No. Yeah, I didn't think so. And I, and I feel like I'm not saying there's a right and wrong answer but I feel like that is the right answer. And that's the answer my brother who asked my sister who homeschools her four children and is on harder than I'm on. Um, like she's in it. And my brother who's very, very different from that and very concerned about his kids like and how they feel about, and he's like, are you ever concerned? And she's like, no, and I don't care. My job is not that. My job is to raise these kids and to make sure that they're in this process and what they're doing. And I feel everything we're discussing right now, everything we've gone through, we are so concerned with feelings and how we feel versus doing the right thing and going towards that thing that is the difficult thing. It is not easy what you're doing. I know that. I know how you were raised. I know what you went through. I know your childhood. I, we are connected and I know the struggle it's been from where you were at as a child to where you're at as a parent, but what you are determined to do as that parent, you and your wife, are determined to do as parents. And I know it's not a concern of whether or not your kids love you. What is your concern is raising your children and, and, and providing this thing that so many people are missing, and that's nothing more than what you're doing with yourself. Yeah. Maybe I'm just concerned that, uh, you know, weighing at 106 kilos, that if my kids aren't strong, they're not gonna be able to get me up off the ground. <laughs> hey, I'm stuck on the toilet, G, help me out. Um, you know, I, there are just some things that aren't optional. No. As a human. Yeah. And you certainly can make them optional, but I'll see you in five years, I'll see you in 10 years, I'll see you in 20 years. Let's get as macabre as we can. When you, I've worked in the hospital a lot, and when you die and you're in the hospital, which is a terrible place to die, oh, your world gets smaller and smaller and smaller. You don't go outside. You're suddenly in a, you know, you're in a room where it doesn't have a window with a curtain. You have less privacy. You have less intimacy. And as you get sicker, that shift gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And you know, the goal, I think, I mean, it doesn't have to be everyone's goal, but my goal is that my wife and I are being chased and the cops in our stolen vet at 110, you know, where you get, you get shot in the back. I don't remember who said this. You're shot in the back by a jealous lover as you climb out the window at 110 years old, mm -hmm. right? That's, mm -hmm. you know, the notion is, hey, particularly, I think, when you're, when you're 20, you can do a lot of dumb stuff. You can eat a lot of pizza and mm -hmm. drink beer and still be pretty exceptional. And, yeah. and let's not say that that's bad. Let's say your body has, gives you enough reps that you can learn by buffering that. The same way a child will fall so many times before she learns to stand, right? The number of errors, 10,000 repetitions is how many times a child falls before they can stand, 10,000 times. That means we have enough duty cycles built in to be able to tolerate errors and mistakes and wildness until we start to learn. But when you're 30 and 40 and 50, you really, the, the bill is due and you better stop dicking around because you're gonna be 100 and your goal is to keep those windows open, to die in a big room, to die in the way you want to die, on the paddle out, choosing, uh, you know, so you're at home with your family because you passed in your sleep. Playing on a playground. Whatever is your choice. <laughs> and 
I think that's really what was at stake for someone. And you know, now maybe I couldn't even appreciate it when I was 30 because I was, I had a lot of innate ability to buffer until things didn't work for me. You know, I had myself off the national team with a terrible injury to my neck that made my hand numb. Mm -hmm. I had terrible asthma. Mm -hmm. I was using my rescue inhaler 15 to 20 times a day. I had to re <laughs> register my inhaler with the IOC. It was terrible. Why is your mouth open, bro? Bro, what are you doing? Because <laughs> I was in a t bad shape and it was do more, do more, do more. And I, I was that guy, right? Plausible deniability. As long as I, look how hard I train. I did three times a day. I don't know why I get injured. You know, I'm, it's mine. And whenever we decide to wake up, good for us because the next 70 years <clears throat> are important. And I really feel like we need to be playing this much longer game. And you can fall off the wagon, go to Vegas, burn yourself down, do what you need to do. But when you come back home, how much are you sleeping? Do you have a way of dealing with your stress? Are you in a tribe? Are you uncomfortable every day? Mm. I think those things are important. Yeah. You know, did you eat a green thing? <laughs> you know? And, and as we get into the psychology of this, it should be a lot simpler than it is. You know, where we're, you know, uh, one of our genius nutrition friends said he had a really bad client. I mean bad, he was in bad shape. And what our friend said is, hey, before we talk about your diet, I need you to get a dog. And the guy's like, what? And he says, just get a dog. I'll, I'll take you on if you get a dog. So the guy got a dog. What did, what did the dog force this guy to do? Take him for a walk. Take him for a walk. And then, guy, then our friend's like, hey, I want you to drink a glass of water a day and take your dog for a walk. And that was his first intervention for like two weeks. Walk, take your dog for, just take care of your dog, drink a glass of water a day. And the guy's like, whoa, I lost 15 pounds. And I feel so much better. My blood tests better. John's like, good talk, right? So that's how we're going to have to trick ourselves. And with my daughter, you've got to go. This is how human beings eat. Yeah. This is when we sleep. It's lights out, bro. Every phone is in the kitchen every single one and now we even have a lockbox so that you just you can't unlock it if you want to open the lockbox it's clear it's for cookies apparently but it works for tech and uh, if you want to open it you have to smash it you have to destroy it there's no shortcut who's got the, who's got the code it unlocks after three hours oh. after four hours after wow. five hours so if you're having a hard time with impulse control because you should, because this stuff is, makes my brain so good, wow. right? That's fantastic. I, I think it's I, fantastic. I put all my cookies in there. Yeah, I mean, just the advent of my departure from social media like a month ago, I have literally, I'm just like, I don't, I forgot my phone. Oh, I, I just you're left. You're one of my most self-aware friends. Well, I, I, and guess what? Yeah. How much time? I grabbed George's phone the other day. Again, this is never a game we're going to win. Well, she, this is also... She was on, her phone was active and on four and a half hours a day. That means that she's at school texting her friends. Mm -hmm. She's, you know, checks in. So she's listening to music. She's yeah. into music. Well, remember what she said to me about Snapchat? I'm socializing. And I'm like, that's not socializing. She doesn't, <laughs> she doesn't have Snapchat, so she better not. But she said something about Snapchat. Uh, my, uh, my point is... I think we have to recognize that the easy way, if it feels easy, you should be suspicious. Yeah. That's a pretty yes. good thing. I'm starting to become self-aware that when I have to have a hard conversation with someone, I should move towards that. There's opportunity there. I'm like, going to be uncomfortable I call saying. That <laughs> I'm going to be uncomfortable with this. Let's, let's do this. No human being goes towards confrontation as fast <laughs> as Laird Hamilton. You don't need to fight. Yeah. But what you can no, say is, boy, no. I really messed up. That was, yeah. really, it was hard for me to say yeah, I messed I, I up. I literally had the, this scenario play out with a neighbor get, yesterday where I had my dog. I had Izzy, who's a pit bull. Um, and she's the easier one of the two dogs. And his two chihuahuas continually get out of the house. Like the gate's left open. And they are just vicious. These vicious. And they've come after us. Like I think this was the fourth or fifth time. And I'm on the phone talking. And... Literally, he's got both dogs and he's walking out and one of them yanks off with the leash. Comes out, nipping at Izzy, and I'm just holding her back and I'm on the phone and I'm just like, Jesus, fuck. You know, and I'm like, this is like the fifth time. And he's like, what do you mean the fifth time? And he got his dog and he's like, 
you can talk to me, talk to me. And I'm on the phone and I'm like, dude, this is like the fifth time your dog has come out of that gate at my dogs. And I, it was a really terrible conversation. I was, I was on the phone. I had my dog. I was, I was a little fried at his dogs and I hadn't been able to communicate this with him, right? This all unfolds. He's upset. I'm upset. He handles it terribly. I handled it terrible. Walked away, did our thing. And I literally walk away from this and I'm like, that was terrible. <laughs> Today, he's driving by, stops his car, gets out of the car. I walk over to him and I'm like, I am sorry, before he could say it. I'm like, I handled that terribly. And that was the opportunity in the whole thing. And this is that thing. It's just like, oh, I'm running from this confrontation or this thing, or I'm not handling, I'm handling this in some way that I'm not, I have not been observing in or I'm not listening to. Oh, this is what, what's happening when the interval's hard. This is when I'm falling apart at the seams and, I, and I'm rah, rah, making noises or what I'm doing. And, you know, this is that thing in that practice of my opportunity to go and, and write something or do something or learn that is from something. so hard. Right? I messed up. And now Tim is my buddy. And he's this little runner guy who's been attacked by dogs. And like, you know, I'm like, it's okay. Like, I'll help you. <laughs> you want some bread, bro? Yeah, you want some bread? I'll oh, man. Bread. I tell you what, that's, uh, that really is it. Uh, I love that Gabby says she goes first. Yeah. And because, you know, your reaction of going second or being defensive is a great survival strategy. Dude. And are you in business? Especially of, as a kid. Are you in the business of surviving? Or are you in the business of living? Yeah. Because I think a lot of us are in the business of surviving. Yeah. And because that has served us really well. You know, who, I'm trying to think about who trained my mom into being a good parent. Yeah. You know, her mom died when she was 18, mm -hmm. right? Her dad was working her ass off. Da, da, da. I, mean, I mean, just who learns? Where do you learn this? I mean, look at the number of... Um, you know, our generation, you know, your parents are still married. Yes. Crazy. His parents are still married. You're like the only two. Your wife's parents are still married. Everyone else, divorced. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, we're going, we have an opportunity to take sport and say there are lessons in here that restore humanity. There are lessons in here that make me a happier, more durable person. And that's why it matters. Yes. That's yeah. why it matters. Because we haven't given people the first aid kit of the toolbox. And it's not going to be easy. And it's not roses. And it shouldn't be. It's, it's ugly. And there's times where, you know, I would come in off of the uh, airplane at Sunday after teaching a course, two courses back to back. And I'd go right to the gym at 1 in the morning. And I'd sleep on my table. I'd get up at 5 and teach the 5.30 a.m. class. You know, I'd sleep at the gym on my treatment table. And, uh, you know, someone asked me, you know, I was doing a, a nutrition consult ages ago, and this woman was saying, she's like, oh, it says to here you have one to two cups of coffee a day. And I was like, there's no hyphen. And uh, she was silent for a second. She's like, you have 12 cups of coffee a day? And I was like, at least. I was like, that's three 20-ounce Americanos. That's 12 shots. How much coffee do you have a day? All of it. <laughs> I don't know how much is available. <laughs> when I run out of coffee, time. When I eat all the cookies, time. time. So, uh, you know, the point is, there's, it's okay that there are times in your life where it is bad and you're on the verge. Dude. Set parameters yes. when you can come back to center. Yes. Come back to center. Yeah. Spend your fitness. Spend your credits. Come back and rebuild the tank. I can't agree more with obviously with all of this but the fact that i see sport as this thing as this opportunity for deep practice in a way and, and obviously not only through my own personal experience with sport and what it's done for me and it it it, it probably saved my life but oh, yeah. it's also in every way shape and form it's been one of the catalysts and drivers of the poor behavior that I've had where I have not been able to, where I was not paying attention to that. Hence not playing soccer and going into water polo. Oh, cause I was too violent and physical in soccer. And it just turns out that I was not the drama. I was not the drama queen. I was actually the guy who was throwing fists. Right. And that's not behavior. That's okay. And that stuff needs to change. And although I was only 10, 
right? Like, although at, at a young age, you don't realize that that's, you know, sure, you know, your parents are telling you that's bad, but, you know, as a kid who's rebelling because he's trying to get attention because he's not getting attention, that's the perfect mechanism. But that doesn't work real well when you become an adult. Not when you want meaningful relationships and good businesses. No, but then, you know, you, you get involved and you find joy and you find passion in something, which is Or satisfaction. Training. Satisfaction, right? Find purpose, meaning in, oh, I'm learning about the body and how it works and, oh, I'm connecting this back to my experiences through my life and, oh, wow, I found what I really want to invest myself in right now. A relationship with my wife who was a professional athlete, who's retired from being a professional athlete. I've worked with umpteen, dozens, hundreds of professional athletes at the highest level. And the experiences that have happened and what I've seen and what I feel is that missing piece is, the, is, is what we're all talking about right now. We're, we're all talking about it, every one of us. And it's this thing of deep practice of what am I doing this for? What am I learning from it? What, wh why am I going into my gym in my garage and working out? Is it just to move? Or is it to understand why I'm, what, what, what I'm missing in that movement or what I'm missing in that intensity of that movement and where the gap is yeah. and what I can improve upon? Well, I, I don't know about that, but I'll let you know. Because <laughs> still working it out. Dude. You know? I, I mean... I was at the top of a mountain in terms of having aerobic ability and I purposefully at one point decided to come all the way back down and say, I'm going to see what it's like to totally rebuild this entire thing and I'm getting back up that thing right now. And I'm not, I don't think there's ever an end game to that, right? That development takes... I'll, I'll let you know in another decade. Yeah, maybe. Maybe. May, maybe. Like Don Wildman was still, at, at 80, was still figuring that out. Like getting, pushing. Yeah, I, I think you're right. I think, we'll, I think we'll die before we figure it out. Yeah. That's okay. Yes, um, it is. I, I, this is the big thing. Is that I think we're so afraid of that dying thing that we're not actually living. And that's what living is, is it's a process. A process in what I'm doing versus just an outcome because th that's just a denial of being is becoming something oh. you know and and I think that's where we really are learning and I think you know we're looking to people right now who are trying to see how long we can push life who want to live forever and yet the people that are driving this are arguably based on the Information. No, no, no. Personal experience, the most dysfunctional people we know. Personal and what I've been able to look at, there's no, I, I don't, there's nobody more afraid of dying than the people who are leading this charge. And uh, well, that's scary. Alan Lim, great exercise physiologist, yes. had a great saying, he says, you cannot cheat your physiology. No. The bill will come due. Yep. And you can apply that any way you want. But you can't cheat. There's no cheat code. There's no hack. There's no workaround. It's the long game. Yeah. Yep. It's so hard. <laughs> it's so fun, though. I just want to watch. Why at 44 am I having more fun than I was 10 years ago? I, I just am. Yeah, you I'm know. enjoying the entire process of it. Do you, th do you think you can get there without, you know, if you had, and then we're just rambling on. And it's all right. We'll wrap this up. But my, uh, <laughs> if you ask me, like, my fears for my kids, what I would say is I, I, I don't, I'm afraid they'll never find satisfaction to work the way I have. You know, like, I love what I do. I, I'm born to this. I love patterns. I love work. I love this thing. This is it. This is all, I don't think I, I think I'm unemployable now. But I, I am definitely... <laughs> But the, the thing is, you know, you have to process and go through. You have to have experience. 
in order to end up in the other realm. So for me, I think what, I, what we're trying to do is we're trying to sift best practices so that someone doesn't have to reinvent the wheel. They can optimize the wheel. And the optimization is, th is the practice, right? And if, if, if we don't have to discover, to uncover again and again and again the basics, then maybe we can use this time to get through and actually improve or not have to go back or take stupid side or sabotage ourselves. And that's my big fear is that my kids are going to, I'm going to really, really difficult in your 20s and 30s when you're struggling to find self and identity in all your work. That's going to be hard to watch. But I'm like, enjoy that fucking interval, kid. Bro. Because I, you know, what, what you're Georgia doing... broke her leg. I made her cry every day for three months. In I know. Head. Oh, I know. What you're, so Robert Sapolsky wrote why, why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers. He's the world famous evolutionary biologist at Stanford. In one of his lectures, he just quickly says something. That, and he, he's, it's crazy, but this is it. And, and you're applying this. And this is what the long game is. Is that evolution is not an architect, it is a tinkerer. And we are trying to be architects with so many things. And so we get hooked onto a tool as if this is going to create the Sistine Chapel. And that is not what's gonna happen. And that isn't what is happening based on ACL tears, anxiety levels. Choose mental disease in 2025 will be the number one killer of, of human beings in general. Is that because of what we're doing? Or is that just a fluke thing? Because based on what I understand, the work of Yuval Harari, you look at all these people, Sapolsky, whoever, what, all, all of them, connect the dots. We are in the first time where unless, you, you know, unless you're a genetic disorder, self-created disease runs everything. And we're just going in a circle, banging our heads and missing life and this joy and this process of what it means to be human and to actually experience what it's like to raise a child. And that's exactly what has been an expression of your work, is what you do with your kids, it's what you did with your work. And what you did with your work is what you've done with your kids and your wife and yeah. your life, you know? I just like to eat cookies. I want to watch Star Wars. Mm -hmm. Both do. I might eat some cookies tonight because I've heard cookies a few times. And now it's, it's my jam. You, basically what you've done is you've done that dopamine thing with me where you've created a reward loop that where, oh, shit, that, why is that in there? It needs to be the Venom voice. Cookies. <laughs> Maybe I'll watch you do You are a loser. Again tonight? Like me. <laughs> and eat cookies. It's so good. Dude. Appreciate you. Thank you. Yeah. Love you. Um, just real quick, uh, can we talk about the nails? And why? What nails? The, the weird. Have people been able to see? The, We're talking about. The, the, yeah, they've been able to see these. Well, you know, so we, my, we, we don't need to go deep. No, with my daughters, you know, there's some things that are about personal expression. Yes. Like if you wanna, if you wanna have kid rebel, <laughs> just give them any freedom. So one of the things they're allowed to do is color their hair. And, uh, and they do. And they do. And you wanna rock your, uh, you know, so we are going to get the mani pedi. And I, 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 my dream was to be surrounded by women as a kid. It was a great dream. He's it successfully just, pulled that off. It just turns out they're all related to me. <laughs> and when you understand the implications of that dream, it's, it's horrifying being the only man yeah. in the room. But uh, you know, Caroline's like, hey dad, we're gonna, you know, I go get the Manny Petty, I get the Petty, but I don't get the, the yeah. polish. And this time she was like, dad, we're doing it. And uh, they just happened to also call up their uncle Brian. And so, so we're, we're rocking it. In case you thought that we decided to paint our nails together. Well, it's well, also, we you did, can see the difference. But, yeah. That's black. This is blue black. This is like your car. This is like. <laughs> in the sunlight. Juliet's car. <laughs> and that, I think that's the nuance. I'm, Brian. I got the, roped into going. If you're dark, dark, I'm light, dark. Yeah. Yes. I'm dark, dark. <laughs> I, I've always said that when, they, when I die, they're going to find out my skeleton's been murdered out. <laughs> <laughs> so good dark dark white dark, dark. dark you know and here's here's the thing i was like all right you know I used to paint my nails as a kid and i was like okay we'll do it this time and i actually like it it's better yeah i think that's better i, I, I feel actually, prettier it, it it gives me the ability to have conversations with people that are awkward and 
Therefore, I feel like I'm improving. Dude, if you weigh 236, you can do whatever you want with your nails. See, I'm only 190, but. <laughs> <laughs> Why, hey, sir, are you okay? Why, should you, why are you out here on that bike? You know, 236 pounds, I'm like, I don't know, man. I don't know. This is how I woke up one day. <laughs> Turns out lifting heavy weights for a long time. Who I am. <laughs> Appreciate you. Love you, dude. Love you, too. Thank you.